experiences I've had. Uh, I don't have a captive audience at home so much from, from my own children, so I'm going to soak this up. I asked my daughter um, yesterday uh, if she wanted to come tonight. Uh, for those of you who know us um, know we just had our third child back in December, and so Bethany, my wife, is, is at home with the baby tonight trying to avoid uh, germs at this point and, and uh, you know, the flu um, in this early stage of, of our son's life. Um, but we were talking about whether we should um, try to make it, whether they should try to make it and join me. Um, and I said, well, maybe, maybe our oldest would want to come and hear this because she's starting to get interested in some of these questions about faith and, and that sort of thing. And so I asked her, you, you know, do you want to come tonight, Miriam? Um, and she said, well, how long are you supposed to talk? <laughs> and I said, oh, probably around an hour. And she said, no, I want to stay home. <laughs> um, well, I hope, I hope tonight, uh, I'm a little bit under the, the weather, like Mike said, but um, I'm thinking, I was thinking this afternoon, and I was reminded of, um, I'm old enough to remember Michael Jordan's Game 5 performance in the NBA Finals where he had the flu. And, you know, he was barely able to walk off the court at the end. And uh, So maybe this is what tonight is going to be for me. You know? um, but uh, I hope you're able to get something uh, edifying out of this, um, wherever you're coming from. Um, whether, whether, I don't know most of you, but um, whether you're coming from a Protestant background, maybe you're a guest here tonight, or, or whether you've been Catholic your whole life. Um, my goal is that you understand your faith a little bit better, and um, we titled it, Why Be Catholic? Um, probably a better title for it would be, Why Am I Becoming Catholic? Because we're, really what I want to do tonight is just share my faith story, and uh, Part of that very much is, is thinking through things, thinking through theology, thinking through doctrine. And I'm going to share some of that today. Um, and I guess I'll start with my, my upbringing, which was a very, I would say, devout Protestant upbringing. We were the kind of people that were in church every single uh, time that the church was open. We'd have these, it was a very small country church um, in eastern Ohio and um, farm community, and um, we'd have Sunday morning service, we'd have Sunday evening service, and we'd have a weekday prayer meeting, and my family, we'd go to all of them. Um, and it was very important to my, my parents that we go to all of them. And um, I grew up in what I would call the Wesleyan holiness tradition. Now, my denomination is one that most people haven't heard of, um, the Evangelical Church of North America. But really, this, this denomination started um, probably some of the closer churches that you may have heard of would be the Church of the Nazarene, um, United Methodist Church, or uh, Free Methodist Church. So these are all churches that trace their heritage back through John Wesley, the um, English preacher. Um, in the 1700s, who started the Methodist, uh, the Methodist Church. And so that was the tradition I grew up in. My particular denomination, it formed, I think, around 1968, whenever the Methodist Church joined together with what was then called the Evangelical United Brethren Church. It was a Brethren Church. Um, and they joined together to form what we know of as the United Methodist Church. Well, my particular church was a bunch of uh, churches that did not want anything to do with the merger. So they didn't merge, and they went and they formed their own denomination. And, and that was the denomination that I grew up in. Um, broadly speaking, I, so I'd say we were Wesleyan holiness. What exactly does that mean? Um, I've come to see Wesleyanism as a, uh, 
you could almost look at it as a mini counter reformation to the reformation i think it's sort of a shift back in the direction of of catholicism at least a little bit um, and the reason i say that if you think of classic protestant reformed theology and when i say that i'm thinking of people like um, john calvin is probably the most famous um, but the dutch reformers what are they famous for? What's their doctrine? Um, usually people will characterize it as TULIP. Have you ever heard of TULIP before, that acronym TULIP? Um, TULIP, it's an acronym that stands for, the T is total, total depravity. Uh, the U is unconditional election. And the L is limited atonement. The I is irresistible grace. And the P is preservation of the saints. Now, that's short. What does all that mean exactly? So let's start with the T, total depravity. This relates up to what people, it relates up to the doctrine of original sin. And the doctrine, what, what the reformers would say about the doctrine of original sin is that we are, in short, totally depraved. Uh, that there is, we are completely fallen. Our nature is completely fallen. And what exactly does that mean? Well, I think you see different reformers say different things to be charitable when they, when they um, try to articulate what that means. Some have said, um, gone the full nine yards with it, and they say, there is nothing. There is no goodness in us whatsoever. In fact, if you are, um, if you are not saved, you are... Uh, completely devoid of goodness. And even if you do something that appears good, well, it's in appearance only. Um, some have gone that route. I don't know that most reformers do, but, but they mean at least this much. Um, they mean that our fallenness is complete. It affects every aspect of our human nature, our intellects, um, our wills especially. And you know, depending on how you cash that out, it, um, it might be objectionable, it might not be objectionable. I think it's a mistake to think that we're totally depraved of any goodness whatsoever. Um, the Catholic teaching on this is that, what, we're fallen. That's not to say there is zero goodness in us whatsoever. Um, so I, I wouldn't go quite that far if, if people want to go that far. But unconditional election, what does that mean? It means that, um, I have to look at my notes here. God chooses to give the elect eternal life. Um, and he doesn't look for any goodness in you whatsoever. There's nothing you could do um, to earn it or merit it. So it's God chooses uh, the elect. And then limited atonement, this is something that... Um, the reformers believed the atonement, Christ's sacrifice, it's limited in its, um, I want to say this right, it's limited in its effect. It's limited to those who become the elect. It's not for everyone, it's for the elect. That's not to say it couldn't be for everyone or that it's uh, not good enough for everyone. No, they think it is good enough for everyone, but they think in terms of practical uh, matters, it's limited. It's not for everyone, it's for the elect. And um, then there's the irresistible grace. Irresistible grace is the idea that you cannot resist God's grace. If you're one of the elect, um, there's nothing you can do about it. You, you are, uh, God's grace is irresistible for you. And then last one, preservation of the saints. That means that God will preserve his elect until the day of judgment. You cannot fall away from grace. You cannot fall into a, a you cannot fall out of a state of grace um, on this view. So that in short is the, the classic reformed theology in a nutshell. And we in the Wesleyan tradition rejected most of that. Um, we didn't believe most of it at all, frankly. So one of the ways we disagree with it is 
we don't think that God's, we didn't think that God's um, grace was irresistible. Um, why? Because that seems to get in the way of human freedom, human free will. God's grace is irresistible, then what? I must not be free in some sense. Um, we didn't agree with the limited atonement in the Wesleyan tradition. We thought that God's grace was offered for who? Everyone. And then couple that with the um, free will, people can choose to reject it. Uh, that's what we thought in the Wesleyan tradition. And we didn't agree with preservation of the saints. That is, we thought that um, Christians could fall away from, from grace. They could, they could go into a state of sin and, and reject Christ. Maybe after they've come to some sort of saving faith, they, they turn around and, and reject it. Um, you know, it reminds me of the parable of, of the, the sower with the seeds that sprout and then wither away. Um, so we didn't agree with the reformers on that. So you can see here, there was already, I guess, from my starting place, some, um, I didn't know it at the time, but some similarity between what I was taught as, as a boy and some of the things that the Catholic Church teaches. Um, now, what should I say? What else should I say? Um, I remember personally being keenly aware of my, my sinfulness as a boy. Uh, I felt extreme guilt over it at various times. And I remember, I don't know when, but I remember going, we would have altar calls in our church. Where, and this was the time where you would um, ask Jesus into your heart. That's pretty typical Protestant um, lingo. You would, you would go and you'd pray the sinner's prayer, some version of the sinner's prayer, where you would um, confess your sins, confess that you were a sinner, and then, and then state that you wanted um, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I don't remember when I did that, but I probably did it very young, four or five years old. Um, and... The other thing that my church emphasized was the doctrine of sanctification. And um, we didn't understand it in the way that the Catholic Church understood it, but um, the doctrine of sanctification, it's, it's at least this much, uh, well, I mean, we would have agreed with this much in the church that I grew up with, that sanctification is the way in which God purifies you from that fallenness that we, we find ourselves in um, from original sin. So what's original sin do? It's, it's corrupted us. Uh, we find, to use an old English word, that we, we have a carnal nature. And we don't will the things that we ought to will. Paul talks about this. Um, our desires are, are badly messed up. And even whenever we start to want to desire the right things, we still find ourselves doing the wrong things, right? And so sanctification is supposed to be that grace by which um, that is corrected. And now, my church taught that this was something that happened instantaneously. And... Um, how did this happen instantaneously? Well, what happened was you became a Christian, you confessed your sins, you asked for Christ to come into your life, and therefore you became justified. Um, in the Catholic tradition, you might call that initial justification. You've, you've come to accept some sort of a faith in Christ. You've asked for forgiveness. Um, but then we would have said, you're going to find over your Christian life as a young believer that you still have this deep problem of sinfulness in your life. And that needs to be corrected. And uh, that's where the doctrine of, of sanctification comes in. You need to be sanctified of your, your broken will, your sinful nature, um, so that you can not constantly be sinning and, and corrupting yourself. Um, but we thought that this was something that happened instantaneously. And so, um, as a child, I heard many, many messages this is, that um, you needed to 
come down, hear God's call, and invite the Holy Spirit into your life. This was supposed to be what we called a baptism of the Spirit. So, and, and the scriptural support they would have used for this would have been the, um, the upper room, where the Holy Spirit comes down upon those in the upper room and um, the tongues of fire, right? And they received the Holy Spirit. So in our, in our doctrinal tradition, that was, you received the Holy Spirit after you came to accept Jesus into your life. And um, um, when you received the Holy Spirit, you were supposed to be able to live a, sin, a sinless life. No more sin. And, and I heard people testify to this kind of thing, not too often, but they would say, you know, praise God, we would have testimony time in our church, praise God, I haven't sinned since whenever, um, and they would kind of sound self-righteous, but they would uh, thank God for that. Uh, and I found in my own life that I really wanted that, I really wanted to be sanctified, I really wanted to no longer be tripping myself up and, and corrupting myself. And uh, so I remember quite young again going to the altar and praying that I would receive the Holy Spirit and that God would sanctify me, purify my heart, cleanse me from evil. And um, this was initially I would have a feeling of I'd done the right thing, this was good, there was going to be a change, and what would inevitably happen would be that a day later, go back to school, whatever, um, I, I would find myself sinning again. I'd find myself thinking things I ought not think, and um, I was incredibly frustrated by this. In fact, at one point it led to I would say in high school, it led to uh, some depression within my own life, um, where you know I was a, I was a young teenage boy dealing with all the hormones and whatnot of, of that time period, and I found myself constantly struggling with certain thoughts and sinning, and and I would pray for forgiveness, and then I'd think, well. Because we thought, you know, we thought you would lose your, saint, your, your salvation if you sinned. And, and we were kind of um, pretty uh, cut and dry about this. So it was like the moment you sin, um, you've lost your salvation. And so I was in real fear of hellfire when this would happen. I'd think, well, I've sinned. I've lost my salvation. I've got to get it all back. So I pray for forgiveness. And then I 